when the historians of the future write about the year 2019, they will undoubtedly see it as a year when a fundamental change occurred, which will affect the whole march of events for the next historical period. Now, you might be surprised that I say that. Because on the, on the surface of it, there doesn't seem to be any, any dramatic change. Now, Lenin said that politics is concentrated economics. And it is true, in the last analysis, as Marx explained, in the last analysis, it is always the economic questions that are fundamental. They, they, fundam they ultimately determine everything. Yes, but that does not mean that you can reduce everything to economics. From a Marxist point of view, the reason why we study economics, we study the movement of the, ca the capitalist cycle of booms and slumps, not from an academic point of view. I really detest this expression, <laughs> academic Marxists. What the hell is an academic Marxist? Either you're an academic or you're a Marxist. You can't be one thing or the other. But anyway, they spend all their time discussing the ins and outs, uh, tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Or as I prefer to, I prefer to refer it as the falling rate of theory. But in any case, from our point of view, it's important to discuss economics, it's a science. But our interest in economics is not an abstract uh, question. We're interested in economics from the point of view of how it shapes the consciousness of different classes in society. Now, 10 years have passed since the, uh, the, the dramatic events of 2008, 2009 in particular. That was the deepest and the most serious crisis in 200 years of, of, of capitalist history. And it has shaped everything. Oh, yes, that was a decisive turning point that shaped everything else. Everything else come, flows from this. That, that's true. But some people ask me, well, okay, the crisis of capitalism, here's the crisis of capitalism. You say, you say it's the deepest crisis. Where's the revolution? Why haven't the workers taken power? When is the working class going to move? I answer to that question, I'd say. To that question, my friend, to that question, I have a very precise answer. I can tell you exactly. I can tell you exactly when the working class is going to move. The working class will move. When they are ready, not one minute before, not one minute afterwards. And uh, impatience, impatience in general, in life and in politics, impatience is not a very good counselor. We must follow events as they unfold, as they develop. Human consciousness is not a revolutionary thing, actually. It's not revolutionary. 
It's not even progressive. Human beings are not naturally revolutionaries. Not at all. Not at all. It is a profound psychological truth. Going back as long as you, as long as you care to think. A million years till, till the Stone Age. Human beings are naturally conservative. Oh, yes. People don't like change. They don't like change. Particularly violent suddenties. They don't like it. They're afraid of it. And therefore, they cling naturally to what exists, to the present situation. They will cling to it desperately. To the existing ideas, ideology, religion, morality, parties, leaders, all this. They will cling to these things. Organizations. Until gigantic historic events force them to, to reconsider ideas which they've held all their lives. Force them to, re to rethink. That's not an easy thing. It is a slow and painful process of learning. Yes, but eventually people do learn. Eventually the change does occur, and it can occur suddenly in 24 hours. Trotsky put forward a, a brilliant phrase, a, wonderful, a wonderfully profound dialectical expression, where he referred to the molecular process of socialist revolution. Think carefully about, the, about those very profound words. The molecular process of socialist revolution. What does it mean? This is dialectics. And unless you understand dialectics, you will never understand anything about society, life, or anything else. What it means is that beneath the surface, beneath the surface of apparent calm and tranquility and normality, there are invisible processes, powerful individual processes are at work. That's true in geology. You know, there's an expression in English, as solid as the ground under my feet. Yes, but, but geology teaches us, teaches us that the ground under your feet is not solid, not at all solid. Every, every 10 minutes going up to 100. Yeah. It's as thin, this, this layer of rock and stone and so on, it's as thin as the skin of an apple. And beneath the surface, there's a seething process of uh, extraordinarily high temperatures and enormous pressures building up. Seeking, seeking a, weak, a weak point in the Earth's surface, seeking a way to break through. And it will break through. As night follows day, it will break through. Producing the most cataclysmic events known to, to nature. There is, in society, there is a precise analogy to geology. It's a precise analogy. In all countries in the world, without any exception, beneath the surface of apparent calm, there's a seething discontent 
anger, fury, hatred, and above all, frustration. This, this, is, uh, this accumulates gradually. Invisible. You can't see it. It's invisible. Until it reaches a point where ex an explosion takes place. Let me return to economics. For a period of 10 years, you see, uh, 10 years ago, the, the equilibrium of the capitalist system was destroyed. The economic equilibrium was destroyed. And for the past decade, the bourgeois of all countries have been struggling to restore the economic equilibrium. And they have failed. They have not succeeded. That's a fact. They have not succeeded. The economic equilibrium has not been restored. The situation is nothing like the, the previous situation that existed before 2008. Nothing like it. And we predicted 10 years ago, and we said, all the attempts of the bourgeois to restore the economic equilibrium will merely serve to destroy the social and political equilibrium. And that is precisely what has happened. That is precisely what's occurring now in all countries. I'll give a, I'll give a few examples, but it's obvious. Even in Britain, Bob, Rob referred to the Boris the Barbarian has just become the Prime Minister. Yes. A complete imbecile, a, a clown, a court jester. By the way, elected, you know, Britain is a democratic country, he's elected by 160,000 other clowns. Fanatics, idiots, and people recently released from a mental, a mental asylum. Mad people. The Conservative Party. 160,000 people decide that the, the Prime Minister of Britain. Yeah. No election, no general election, no question of that. And the reason they don't want a general election, they're terrified of a general election, is because there's a serious possibility that Corbyn could win, that a left-wing Labour government could be formed. That's possible. And under these, these conditions, that's dangerous, extremely dangerous. So that's why they resort to these tricks. I'll come back to that to Britain later on. But I'll just say this in relation to Britain. Just say one word, in, one word in relation to Britain. Because that explains to you what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to exp express. Think about it, think about it. Only four years ago, not a long time. Great Britain was considered to be the most politically and social stable country in Europe. What's the position now? After, after the Brexit vote, which has plunged the whole of Europe into crisis, and which is not resolved, Britain is now the most politically unstable country in Europe. And that is pregnant with revolutionary consequences. But we leave that to one side. For 10 years, 
In all countries, the, the ruling class has be, been pursuing a vicious policy of cuts, austerity, savage austerity, savage cuts. <coughs> Holding down wages. While the profits of the bourgeois soar to uh, unimaginable levels. Particularly the bankers. By the way, by the way, by the way, are there any economic students in the hall? Put your hand up. Anyone studying economics? How many? One, two, three. Brave people. <laughs> they, they're prepared to admit, they're prepared to admit that they study economics. That's, that's very courageous in, in this meeting. Oh, the falling rate of, the falling rate of profit. Look, never in history have you had a, a, such a situation where the rate of profit has been increased at the expense of the working class. Never. <coughs> Particularly in the United States, but also in, other, in, in all other countries. You look at, look at the statistics, look at the figures, you'll see. The share of the, the, the wealthy people has been enormously increased, enormously increased. And the share of labor, the share of the workers who produce the real wealth of society has been drastically decreased. For 10 years. The level of inequality, in, I've got the figures but I don't have time to give them, maybe in the reply. Maybe they probably can give figures. You can find them yourself. The level of inequality in the United States of America is, is bigger now than at any time, I think John said the other day, John Peterson, since 1850. Well, I don't know about that, that may be true. I haven't seen that figure. 1850. But what I can definitely say is that there's been this level of inequality has not been seen since uh, the 1920s, since the, since the early 20th century, when the Republican president, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who was a, a populist, if you like, he was a dem demagogue, referred to the ruling class in America, the bankers in particular, As, the, as the, the robber barons, the robber barons. Wages, real wages in America have been held down for, for a long time, for decades actually, been held down. Now they say, they, they all say, they read the press, they all say, it's okay, there's a recovery now, there's a recovery now. American economy is recovered. Oh, they, they add, hey, furthermore, this is the longest recovery in history. The longest economic recovery in history. Yes. They forget, they forget to add, they forget to add, it is also the weakest recovery in history. It's a recovery in inverted commas, but it doesn't feel like a recovery. The workers of America and other countries don't feel that they're, that, that they're any better off. There's no improvement. Yes, the jobs have been created, but what sort of jobs are they? In McDonald's and things like that? You know, low pay, the same everywhere. Low pay, casual work. Systematic destruction of the conditions. I'll tell you a little story. President Trump was meeting with some business uh, uh, associates, fellow billionaires in an expensive restaurant in, in Washington. And he was boasting about his economic success. 
based on tax cuts for the rich, by the way. That's cut, tax cuts for the rich. Had a certain effect. Yes, oh yes. John, you will excuse my American accent, please. He said, I have created one million jobs. <laughs> Sorry, John. <laughs> and uh, 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 the waiter was obviously a, a poor Latino waiter who overheard the conversation. He said, I know, Mr. President, I've got three of them. <laughs> That's not a joke, by the way. Most American workers cannot live, cannot maintain a family on the basis of one job. They must take two or three jobs. So the same, the same profound discontent the same rage, the same bitterness, it, bitterness would be the, strong, the, the best word, bitterness, and a hatred of the rich, a hatred of the rich, but the same, exists in the United States as in all other countries, perhaps more so, perhaps more so. In a peculiar way, the election of Trump re reflected that, in a peculiar, very peculiar way. Of course, the Trump is, is, is a rabid reactionary. There's no need to explain that. That's clear. clear. But he's a, skillful, he's a skillful demagogue. By the way, the word, the word populist doesn't mean anything, Thomas. It doesn't mean anything. You sh shouldn't really use it. It means the same as demagogy, actually. Demagogue is, is the Greek word and populism is the Latin word, that's all, for a, for a demagogue. And Trump is, is, to give him his credit, he is a skillful demagogue. For the first time, I, I don't know, for the first time in, in, in decades, I don't know how long, Trump appealed to the working class, to the workers, yes, to the miners, to the workers, to the unemployed. In, up until recently, nobody talked about the, the working class in America. Nobody talked about it. Even the most left-wing liberals, they talked about the middle class, the middle class. Not anymore. And that's a that is a change. That's an important change. The opinion polls now show. The opinion polls that most Americans consider themselves as working class. That is a change. That's a, that's a profound change. And a, quite a high percentage, about 38%, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Commons will correct me. Say, they were asked, would you vote for a socialist president in the United States? And 38% said yes. And among the youth, it's far higher, far higher. That, that's why Trump lately is attacking socialism, communism. It's not an accident, he's attacking that. <laughs> it's true that the, so Trump, it, it represents, uh, he's a right winger, of course, that goes without saying. But when there's an economic crisis in the States and that's being prepared, The illusions in Trump will disappear very quickly, preparing, preparing a massive shift to the left in America, massive shift to the left. So in relation to the United States of America, I say to the comrades, watch this space, just watch what will occur. You know, in dialectics, dialectics also teaches us that sooner or later things turn into the opposite. Now, as a matter of fact, all, all the serious bourgeois economists are saying, they're talking about a new slump. 
I think they all agree on this. They're predicting a new slump. All the indicators are there. Because this so-called recovery is not real, it's artificial. It's mainly based on a colossal extension of credit. That's the same as they did before 2008, exactly the same phenomenon. The booze was trying to desperately to, to maintain the boom on the basis of credit. Cheap loans. Yes, but these cheap loans do these cheap loans in general are not used for productive purposes. They're not opening new, new factories or developing new technology. On the contrary, they're closing factories. The motor companies, the car Fords is just closing factories in Britain and elsewhere. What, what the capitalists have been doing, because the interest rates are very low, they borrow money at a cheap rate, and they use that for, for, for mergers, for buying up other companies. Creating new gigantic monopolies. That is not, not sustainable. And it's preparing the ground for a colossal slump. Let me put it this way. The present so-called recovery, insofar as it exists, is based on a mountain of debt, a mountain of debt. I've got, I've got the figures here for world debt and it's staggering, they're staggering figures, unbelievable figures. There's a mountain of debt you see these mountains, these beautiful mountains just up the road? The Alps. You know. Sooner or later, mountains experience avalanches. And th that can happen at any time, any time. Can't be precise because economics is not a precise science. Can't be precise. It could be in one year. 18 months, or next Monday morning. Can't say. Anything can provoke a collapse. Anything. You see the nervousness on the stock exchange. The, the, the whole the last few years, the stock exchanges of the world have been going up and down, up and down like that. That shows the colossal nervousness of the bourgeois. They're nervous, they're afraid. And anything can cause a collapse, anything. An increase in interest rates. That's why there's been a conflict between, between Trump and the Federal Reserve. The Federal, Federal Reserve wanted to increase interest rates. Because it's a recovery. Normally you'd increase in interest rates. And there was a furious row between Trump and, and, and the Federal Reserve. And Trump was demanding that interest rates be kept low. In order to prolong this boom, prolong the so-called recovery. But sooner or later there can be an increase in interest rates that would produce, that could provoke a slump. Or a war in the Middle East. A war with Iran. Which would increase oil prices, that would produce a slump. A political crisis, anything. Even some crazy tweet by Donald Trump, and there are quite a few of them. 
can cause uh, a panic. So what I'm, what I'm saying to you is that the present situation is very weak, very unstable, and will not last. And the reason that the economists are terrified and, and, the, and the, the, the serious politicians are terrified of a slump is very clear. Sometimes I'm asked, people say, but Alan, surely the capitalists are clever people, surely they can avoid a slump, surely they can get out of a slump. After all, we've learned from history, haven't we? You know, the comrades know that my hero in philosophy is Hegel, that mighty thinker, Hegel, the great thinker. <laughs> and, he, and he once wrote the following. Anyone who seriously studies history can only arrive at one conclusion. That nobody has ever learned anything from history. <laughs> because they repeat the same mistakes time and time again. And they are repeating now exactly the same mistakes that they made before the collapse of 2008. Exactly the same. They, they have learned precisely nothing. But you see, yes, if you ask me, are there mechanisms the bourgeois can, can use to get out of a slump? I answer, yes. Yes, there are such mechanisms. There are such mechanisms. They're well known. There are basically two mechanisms. One is to lower the rate of interest to increase the rate of profit and to stimulate investment and stimulate consumption, stimulate demand. Yes, that's right. The second one is to increase state expenditure. That was Keynes' great idea, you know. You know the gov government can spend its way out of a crisis. Yes. There's only one little problem. The bourgeois have already used up these weapons. They used up, they're finished, they're no good, they don't work. How can you reduce the rate of interest when, when it's already at zero? Can't, they can't use that mechanism. And how can you increase state expenditure? When they've spelt, spent all their reserves over the, over the last 10 years, all the reserves are spent in bailing out the banks so that there are, there are colossal debts. Every government has got colossal debts, including the United States. Although that's the only country that perhaps has got a little bit of margin for maneuver on interest rates, perhaps. But, but it's very small, very small. So what I'm telling you, and what they know, they know this, the economists know this. That's why they're terrified. The next slump will be deeper and worse than 2008, 2009. Far worse. That's the real perspective. But let me just qualify that. You see, from our point of view as Marxists, we don't need a slump. It's not necessary. In fact, from our point of view, it would be preferable for the present situation to continue. Far preferable. 
You see, the fact of the matter is that these 10 years have not passed in vain, although the stupid sects don't understand this. That's why they don't, un they don't understand anything. They don't understand how the working class moves. They draw pessimistic conclusions. That is why they're in crisis and splitting all over the place. As Rob pointed out. But the fact of the matter is that the, uh, the working class have drawn conclusions. Serious conclusions. Slowly, this, this, this molecular process of socialist revolution, yes, is taking place. You see that reflected in two ways, although really it's the same process, it's exactly the same, same phenomenon, expressed in different ways. The first and most important thing is there's an enormous polarization taking place, a sharp, violent polarization to the left and to the right. which horrifies the bourgeois. The political center has collapsed, or it's collapsing. Everybody's collapsing. You see, and here's an interesting observation. This is something new. I've never seen this before. The ruling class has lost control of its own system. It's lost control of its parties. In America for a hundred years, more than a hundred years, the, the political stability of American capitalism was based on two parties, the Republicans and the Democrats. And the truth is there wasn't much difference between them. Well, they would elect one or they would elect the other and so on. Nothing would change. Nothing substantial anyway. Let's be clear about it. Donald Trump was not the candidate of the American ruling class. He was not. They didn't want him. They went to extraordinary lengths to stop him being elected. And ever since he's been elected, and this is, this is astonishing. Have, have you ever seen anything like it? The ruling class and the state, including the, including the FBI and the CIA, and the mass media, ever since Trump was elected, have engaged in a massive campaign to get rid of him. Trouble is, Donald Trump doesn't want to be got rid of. He quite likes being the president of the United States. He, he enjoys it. You know, but, but there's an open split, an open split in the American ruling class. Lenin explained that the first condition of revolution is that the ruling class should, is not able to continue to rule with the same methods as the past. <laughs> and that there's a split in the ruling class. I mean, it is incredible. The CIA and the FBI are ganging up to try to, try to get rid of an elected president. They try and they try and they try. So far they failed, but this, this is a fundamental, that's the first symptom, the polarization to the, left and the, to, the, to the left and to the right, if you like. But the other symptom which you can see in all countries is on the electoral plane, violent swings of public opinion to the left and to the right, violent swings. 
to the left, also to the right. See that? Like in Brazil. By the way, Bolsonaro is also not the candidate of the Brazilian ruling class. He's not. Didn't want him. <laughs> Anna just said to me this morning, look at the press. Look at the British press. They're all attacking Boris Johnson. This is the bourgeois press. Yes, but he's there. He's there. Uh, what do you see? What, what does this mean? The masses in all countries are desperately seeking a way out of the crisis. Of years of cuts, austerity, falling living standards. They're tired of it. They're fed up with it. Had enough of it. Therefore, they are testing one political party after another, one leader after another, one program after another. And they're watching these governments in a way that they did not watch in the past. And when, when they fail, as they inevitably will fail, they turn, turn violently against them. Violently against them. In the past, the mass organizations, the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, were relatively stable. They existed for years and decades, despite all the betrayals and so on. In my, in my country, in Wales, in Swansea, where Rob and I come from, they used to say in the elections, we don't count the votes, we weigh them. The Labour Party always won, always won. The Labour, Labour. Labor. That was a class vote. I mean, the old lady next door said to me, we asked which way you're going to vote. She said, she said, when my husband died, he told me, you must, must vote Labour even if they put a donkey up, <laughs> which they usually did. <laughs> yeah, but that was, the, that was the same in Scotland. In Scotland, the, it was like a one-party state. Not anymore. Finished. In all countries you see this phenomenon. I'll say a little bit about reformism at a, at a later date. Or maybe I'll say it now. You see, the crisis of capitalism is also the crisis of reformism. After the Second World War for a period of decades, there was an economic upswing, a huge economic upswing. Not, not a boom, an upswing. Lasted for 25 years. And that permitted the ruling class to give concessions. It was the, the classical period of reformism, if you like. In Britain, for example, the Labour Party gave serious reforms, very serious reforms. free health, free education. <coughs> Rob and myself, I'm, we're from a working class, a poor working class family in Wales. I'm the first member of our family to have a secondary education, never mind about a university education. And I went to an elite university in the 1960s, I did not pay anything. Rob didn't pay anything. We had a grant, a living grant, he could live on it. Serious reforms, health service was free. 
A foreigner could come to Britain and have an operation on the national health free, no chance. Full employment. The only time you were unemployed is when you were changing jobs, basically. You compare that to the situation now. All of these reforms have been systematically undermined and destroyed because of the crisis. The capitalists, the capitalists cannot, uh, cannot afford reforms. And the reformist leaders, the social democratic leaders, loyal servants of the capitalist class and imperialism, all of them, are prepared to, uh, make, to, to, carry, to make sacrifices. Not themselves, of course. They live quite well. Inflicting deep cuts and counter reforms, not reforms, counter reforms. Now, workers, workers are very realistic people. They're very realistic people. If the capitalist system works, it functions, why change it? In the United States, they've got a saying in America, if it ain't bust, don't fix it. If it isn't broken, don't fix it. That in, in the case, that made sense. And above all, reformism made sense. Reformism with reforms, that makes sense. Reformism with reforms. But reformism without reforms, reformism with counter reforms, that makes no sense at all. And therefore, you see a process taking place. Or in many countries, the social, the social democracy, the reformists have collapsed. completely discredited by participating in coalition governments with the bourgeois. In some cases, they've disappeared altogether. See, there's no rule that says that because a party was a mass party in the past, it will continue to be a mass party until, until the, end of, uh, the end of the universe. There's, there's no such law as that. Italy is a good example. The Italian Socialist Party, which actually was on the left at one stage, it's disappeared completely. It doesn't exist, and I don't. It, it will never. It will never exist. It will never recreate. That's finished. But more, more surprisingly, the mighty Italian Communist Party. The traditional party of the Italian working class, the biggest communist party outside the Soviet bloc, with the exception of Indonesia until 1965, has been completely and absolutely liquidated. It doesn't exist. Astonishing. Today, there is no working class party in, in Italy. Instead of that, you get the emergence of all kinds, all kinds of peculiar phenomena. In Italy, you have the, the so-called five-star movement. Populism. It's a word that the bourgeois commentators uh, use when they don't know what they're talking about. So they, they've got to say something. But many workers in the, recent, in the last elections, many workers in Italy, they looked at the five-star movement. They, that's the process I'm referring to. Desperately seeking some way out of the class. Let's try these people. Let's, it's a new party. Let's try the five-star movement. It was actually set up by a comedian. 
that seems to be fashionable nowadays. In the Ukraine also, they voted for a comedian. By a, by a big majority, by the way. I suppose in Italy they said, well, okay, I Italian politics anyway is a circus, so one, one more clown won't make any difference. So. No, but there were, they were illusions in the, in the Five Star movie. There were illusions. At least there was the hope, maybe they'll do something, maybe they'll help us. They entered a coalition with this ultra-right-wing uh, Salvini, the, the, the Lega, the, the former Northern League. They betrayed all the hopes that was placed in them. And now I think they're finished. I think they're finished. Unfortunately, that will mean in the next election, Salvini will win. I don't doubt that. There'll be a swing to Salvini. But I'll come back to Italy uh, later on. Because it's my firm opinion that in Italy, precisely because all these po the political parties are discredited, the ground is being prepared for a colossal social explosion in Italy. along the lines of, uh, of 68, 69. But I, I'll come back to it to be later. Now, if we, if we, if, if we uh, the, the, the crisis of reformism I was referring to, in the past, our tendency had an orientation towards the mass social democratic parties. That's no longer the case, with the, with, the, with the exception of Britain. Again, I will deal with that later. But we have to be far more flexible in our tactics now. And the fact of the matter is that there's been a change now. There's been a change in these reformist parties. Although we must be careful in, uh, in, in some countries at least, like Britain, like Austria, like Switzerland perhaps, Spain maybe, but uh, in some countries anyway. These parties have got deep roots in the world, not Spain. In the, these countries have got deep roots in the working class. They've got deep roots. So we should not be in a, be in a hurry to just say, well, they're finished, we won't bother with them. You just keep an eye on them. Keep, keep an eye on these parties. Uh, and observe any, any signs of life that take place. So we'll react accordingly. But you see, the present reformist leaders, the president, are not the same as the leaders in the 30s. When, when Trotsky put forward the, the, the perspective of entrism. At a, time of, at a time of deep crisis, the rise of fascism, Syria, deep crisis also in the social democratic parties, reflected in the rise of mass centrist tendencies, mass left-wing tendencies. which clearly the Trotskyists had to enter, had to participate in that, that's clear. But if you look around Europe at the present time, do you see the slightest evidence of such a phenomenon anywhere with the possible exception of Britain? I don't think so. You see, the old, let's, there is a difference. The old social democratic leaders, even the right-wing leaders, 
they still had some links with the working class. Many of them came from the working class. They knew about socialist ideas, they knew about Marxist ideas, they read Marx. And at least they could talk a language which the workers could understand. They could make left-wing speeches, talk about revolution even on the, fir on the 1st of May. Then they'd, then they'd forget all about it afterwards, of course. In Austria, that was, I don't know, in Austria in 1934, the Social Democrats led an armed insurrection against the fascists. Which was defeated, that's another matter. But just compare that to the present situation. The leaders of the social democracy are bourgeois in their entire social composition, mentality, makeup, instincts. Completely and absolutely divorced from the working class. They, they don't understand anything about it. They live on, an, they live on, on, a, on another planet. Social being determines consciousness. And when we come to the Stalinists, the position's even worse. The old Stalinists, you see, before, before the Second World War, all right, they were bureaucrats, they were gangsters, say what you like. But the old Stalinists, they were a caricature of Bolshevism, a caricature of, Le of Leninism. Yes, but a caricature bears some resemblance to the original. The ex-Stalinists today, and they've lost practically everything anyway, they've lost their support are the most horrible right-wing reformists that you can imagine. They, they're the same as the reformists. There's no difference, none whatever. And they play the same reactionary role, particularly in the trade unions. Very reactionary role. Now, I'm saying this for a reason. You see, the, the mood developing in society, particularly in the youth, but not only in the youth, is a revolutionary mood. Yes, but it's seeking, like the geology, it's, it's seeking a way out, seeking an expression, seeking a point of reference. What, in what way, does this mood of society find a reflection in the reformist organizations? Or in the trade unions, even? It finds no expression whatsoever. Not just at the top, but even at the lower levels. It's become so corrupt, so bankrupt. It can't express, it doesn't express the mood. And yet in Britain, you see, that's, Britain is a bit different. Although it wasn't really different Bef before Corbyn. They were completely and absolutely uh, divorced. Right-wing, Blairites, bourgeois. Then by an accident, it was a complete accident, astonishing accident. But as, as Hegel said, necessity expresses itself through accidents. Corbyn was elected leader of the Labour Party. We know Jeremy Corbyn, Rob and I know Jeremy Corbyn. 
We know, we know his second in command, uh, John McDonald, we know very well. He collaborated with us on Venezuela and other questions. But, co co but and yet you see, you co certainly, certainly they're not, they're not centrist. That's for sure. A centrist is a tendency between left reformism and, Mar and revolutionary Marxism. That's not the case. They are not even very consistent left reformists, if we're to be honest about it. Very shaky, very weak. But once, the moment that Corbyn got elected as leader, or even before that, there was a colossal surge of support for the Labour Party. Colossal surge of support. Especially, for, especially from the youth. Hundreds of thousands of people joined the Labour Party to support Corbyn. The Labour Party now is the biggest political party in Europe. Half a million members. Yes, that's at that's grassroots level. That's at the brand. But at the top, in the Parliament, 90% of the parliamentarians are the same rotten, extreme right-wing, Blairite reactionaries. We're determined to get rid of Corbyn. So there's civil war in the Labour Party. And that opens up big possibilities for us. But that's, that's not the point I was going to make. The point you have to understand is this. How can, how can you explain that one single individual, completely unknown, one single man, suddenly creates this colossal support? It is colossal. You can't imagine. It's transformed British politics. I'll tell you how, how colossal it is. Hands up all of you that have heard of the Glastonbury Festival. Ah, ah yes. Hands up all of you that like pop and rock music. I can see we've got a very big job of work to do <laughs> to improve the cultural level of the IMT. Anyway, anyway, never mind about that. Leave it to one side. How many people go to the Glastonbury Festival, Rob? Does anyone know how many people go to the Glastonbury Festival? It's huge. 100,000, easily, 100,000. Listening to this dreadful rock and roll rubbish music, you know, <laughs> covered in mud and horrible. It's my idea of a nightmare. But there we are, that's just me, that's just me. But la this festival, they never invite political leaders, never. Non political. Last year, they invited Jeremy Corbyn to, to the festival to speak. He gave a, a very laughing speech. More people attended that meeting than attended the concert of the Rolling Stones. There you are. And they were enthusiastic, they were delirious. Pardon? Yes. Chanting, oh, Jeremy Corbyn, and so on. The, the bourgeois media were astonished. They were, what's going on? But you see, that explains the essence of what I'm saying. The mood was already there. Corbyn didn't create that mood. The mood was there. But it needed an expression, a focal point, a point of reference. And he gave them that point of reference. 
Of course, in other countries that is, has not been the case. And therefore, you've had the emergence of all kinds of strange political animals, so-called populism. Syriza in Greece really was a new, a new party, really. Although Tsipras and the others are ex, well, come from the ex-Stalinist camp, right-wing ex-Stalinists. But in Spain, Podemos came from nowhere. And yet it, it grew rapidly. Pablo Iglesias was unknown. I met him a few years ago in Caracas when Chavez died. And he knew who I was, but I didn't know who he was. <laughs> you know, he invited me to speak on his program and so on, which I agreed to do. But it a few left-wing spe radical speeches from uh, Pablo Iglesias. And the support for Podemos shot up from nothing to a big political force. But you see the other side of the coin. Because of the extreme confusion and political weakness of these so-called populists, You see the sellout, the, the, the scandalous sellout of Tsipras in Greece. When was the referendum? Was it last year? I can't remember. Four years ago. Four years ago. Tsipras called a referendum in Greece. When he was in conflict with Europe, with, uh, with Merkel, you know. 